Hey guys, Jeremy here, and I'll be talking about a movie that has greatly divided fans of both Star Wars and movies in general, The Last Jedi. Now despite the title of this video, know that this is the first in a series of videos I plan on doing. While this video will be talking about several issues I had with The Last Jedi, I will also be doing a video following talking about what I found to be so good and if somewhat awesome with the film. One big thing I want to get out of the way with right off the bat though before we start this is I didn't hate the movie. There are points I enjoyed and there are points that extremely frustrated me and that's what this series will hopefully clear up. I am not like nor do I condone the actions of a certain few who have been souring the entire discussion this film is generating. I'm talking about the people who like the ones who want Rotten Tomatoes shut down again. Really guys taking the Batman v Superman butt hurt response are the people who are assigned a petition to remove Last Jedi from the Star Wars canon. Are you actually serious guys? Have you seen the prequels lately? What these guys are creating in fact however is a grouping of anyone who didn't like the movie or had issues with the movie with the people who absolutely despise it and hate anything about it. Instead of there being a clear divide and an open ground for sound discussion and debate, it's almost as bad as the political divide in the United States with people just outright shouting distasteful and hateful things at each other. There is nothing to be gained from this, so know that while I did have issues with the film, I certainly didn't hate it, and I definitely feel that this is a monument in Star Wars canon for just the amount of discussion this film has generated. Also, one more side note, I don't care if any of these issues are going to be explained in the novelization that will be coming. You can't use the, well, if you read the novels, Halo 5 excuse Disney. You had that one try with Poe, and that shit still reeks of terrible story writing. No offense meant to you, Alan Dean Forrester. You didn't write the movie after all, that was Jar Jar. I mean JJ. But now, without further ado, here are the five reasons why I feel The Last Jedi is a bad movie. Number one, the opening crawl means nothing. Starting off with something minor, but it has to be said, this crawl doesn't mean anything. Besides the one sentence stating where the movie is starting, it serves no other purpose than a rudimentary, previously on the last episode of Star Wars. Now I know these crawls have played that purpose in the past, somewhat, but they also tell us about what has happened in between the movies. However, there really isn't anything to be said about this as the movie takes place mere hours after the end of The Force Awakens. Now if this was a choice by the creative heads of Lucasfilms, then I can understand why The Last Jedi director Rian Johnson had no other choice. He was given his plate and he had to eat it. However, if this was his choice, it starts off the list of things that he did that were against the formula of Star Wars. Now whether you agree or disagree with his choices, you can't deny he he did things that people weren't going to expect, and the opening crawl is definitely one of them. However, the crawl has been a placeholder in Star Wars history for a reason. It tells us what's going on or it catches us up on what has happened in between the movies. Each film in the past has had a space of time, sometimes consisting of years or decades ergo the crawl's purpose. Take The Force Awakens for example, everyone, myself included, were glued to every word, every syllable of that crawl because of the 30 years that had passed since the return of the Jedi. The crawl isn't just a recap but a creative and nostalgic means of further expanding the Star Wars universe. The crawl in The Last Jedi doesn't do any of these things, it just states everything that happened in the final half of The Force Awakens. It's very bland and very vague with no extra add-ons or anything to build up what might yet be to come. A minor note, sure, but when something this deterring appears right from the get-go, you can understand some frustration this film has created. Number 2. The Bombers Now before you start smashing all caps into the comments, know that I understand that Star Wars isn't about the realism of space. If anything, it's one of the reasons why I love Star Wars. Sure, there are shows like Battlestar Galactica or Firefly which were more science-based with little to no noise ever heard in space, but that's not why we're watching Star Wars. We go for the bombastic explosions, the pew-pew-pew of the X-Wings, the scream of the TIE Fighters. One of my favorite things in this film is that you can hear the Star Destroyers coming out of hyperspace on the planet. The massive boom sums up the power of the First Order in a nutshell. Huge, powerful, loud, tyrannical, all in one shot. So know that the opening space battle to me was actually pretty awesome. So what I'm saying is I'll forgive the idea of Poe taking out all the guns on the Dreadnought by himself. He's a dope pilot and I'm happy to finally see someone do a 360 about turn in space. I'm fine with the ideas of bombers in space. We have TIE bombers after all. Sure they're more so firing a cluster of energy downwards rather than a physical bomb dropping, but that's alright. I'm pretty much okay with everything. Except the fact that all these pilots are breathing in an open environment. I can forgive almost anything this movie throws at me space-wise. I'll even forgive the bounding cannon shots later on in the movie. 
bounding cannon shots in space. I'll forgive that, but when people are blatantly breathing in an open environment in space, that's just one thing I cannot forgive. Now, if the scene simply had, say, a barrier or a force field that the bombs pass through, that would have been fine. But as we see, Rose's sister reaches through the open bay door to grab the device as it passes down past her. And it might have just been me, but it looks like it's floating in bloody space considering how slowly it's moving. Either that, or it's just really badly edited. Hell, I would have even taken a simpler route. Just give them a space helmet! For space! Literally, just have them in helmets with breathing apparatuses, and that would have been fine. Again, this seems like a tiny nitpick, and as stated, the Star Wars universe is definitely not known for following the laws of physics or space logic in general, but when such basic things like breathing in bloody space are looked over, it makes me wonder why Leia couldn't have just hung around in space for the rest of the movie. She could have just sucked up all the good old space air and been fine according to the logic of this bloody movie, and that's why I cannot let it stand. Number 3, Pose Punishment and Lesson. Now first off, I'm not disagreeing with the idea of Poe having a story arc in this film. I like the idea of Poe going through some character development, as he really was just a side character in The Force Awakens with very little to him except for blowing up the whole Starkiller base. I still don't know how J.J. thought to kill him off early on and then bring him back just as production started, however. Either way, I like that Poe had an arc. I do not, however, agree with how it was executed. Right after the bombing run, Poe was given shit by Leia for disregarding orders and having the entire bomber fleet killed. Now yes, he did did disobey orders and his arc is to learn when to fight and when to flee, when to fight for the resistance and when to, and I still hate the cheesiness of this line, be the spark that lights the fire that will burn down the first order. What I disagree with however is how Johnson executed the sequence. First off, this is definitely not a run-of-the-mill idea. There was some planning put into it. Leia and Poe discuss some means of counter-offensive, as she isn't surprised with his success of taking out the AA guns on the Dreadnought. But then she decides to have everyone pull back to make their escape. Poe disagrees and cuts off communications with her. They continue the run, all the bombers are destroyed, but the Dreadnought is brought down. But when they get back, it looked as though it was a big no-no. I don't know about you, Leia, but there are casualties in war. You have proceeded over much worse losses in New Hope, Empire, and Return of the Jedi, so I don't know why she looks as though this was such a grievous loss. If you aren't following me, here's some math. There were seven bombers and each bomber had three pilots, so that makes 21 pilots. So along with the seven bombers lost, that makes about 28 losses. Include all the X-Wings lost, that makes about, what, 40 losses all together. Now let's take into account the loss of a single massive dreadnought. This thing is a small town and clearly one of the most powerful starships in the First Order's arsenal. So I am going to take an average guess of about 10,000 personnel. This would include commanders, pilots, ground troopers, and others. Now let's put into account the idea of spacecraft on it, including fighters, transports, bombers, etc. So let's add another 500. Then let's include all the land craft, and these are including ATSTs, ADATs, and others. So add another 500. So on average, that's a loss of over 11,000 thousand first order units now called me old-fashioned but that's a butt whooping if i ever saw one that one bomber just committed a mass murder on a galactic scale so why do i bring this up why am i looking into this so much with the numbers and everything well let me ask you this did any of you feel that what poe did was wrong Obviously he disobeyed orders, but do you feel that what he did was actually for the greater good? That's how I felt. It's not every day, well, actually New Hope and Force Awakens would disagree, that you get a KD count of 275 to 1. What would have worked better in my opinion and would have helped solidify the lesson the film was trying to push was if the bombing run had only crippled the Dreadnought or better yet failed entirely. But obviously Disney wouldn't have wanted the good guys to get their asses handed to them right off the bat, even though that's exactly what happened at the beginning of Empire. See, I feel the lesson of knowing when to run and when to fight and when to be a true hero to the resistance and keeping the fire burning would have been better illustrated if Poe's attack had been nowhere near successful. He would have felt broken, possibly even hesitant to try something on that scale again, or the film could have just kept with the same angle that they went with and it would have still made more sense to his character. He would be wanting to right a wrong, avenge the loss of fallen comrades. This would have made more sense to his thinking during the skiff charge at the end of the movie when he calls a retreat. I just personally feel that due to the absolute victory of the bombing run, the weight of the lesson isn't as solid as it could have been. It didn't help either that the character forcing the lesson on Poe was a complete imbecile, but that's coming up later. 
I did like that Rian Johnson actually told a tale against the norm of Star Wars. That being a brave and fearless captain sometimes isn't everything that you need it to be. Sometimes it is a braver and wiser thing to flee and live to fight another day. I just don't agree with the execution of this lesson. Also, considering how slow those bombers come out of nowhere, there's no way that they didn't see what was going on. Number 4. The entire concept of the chase between the Resistance and the First Order is broken. So for this one I'm going to use a whiteboard, so I forewarn you, my drawing is awful, but my point will still be clear. There are so many obvious ways around this issue that either fans who love this movie are willing to look over such a serious flaw or they don't care, but for me this is one of the worst parts of the movie. After the bombing run, the Resistance is on the run from the First Order, which includes several Star Destroyers and Snook's massive capital ship, and the Resistance only has one large capital ship with several small frigates. The Resistance has figured out that they can't jump to light speed again because the First Order has a light speed tracking MacGuffin tool. That will be brought up, believe me. So their only option is to keep going forward, but for the First Order can't blow them up because the Resistance ships are lighter and faster. Again, not going to go into the idea of something being lighter in space. No friction, but whatever. So the whole idea of the scenario is that supposedly as long as the Resistance ships keep going forward, they will stay out of the First Order's cannon range until they run out of fuel. No one saw any problem with this. I have so many issues, I have subcategories for this. A. The shields are impervious as long as they are far away? What happened to the concept of shields in Star Wars? We've always heard in space movies with shields being at 70% or something like that. So why didn't this happen with the Resistance capital ships? They were being plugged by bounding cannon shots for over 15 hours. We see that they were making contact almost every time we cut back to Poe and Vice Admiral Doofus. So why are the shields in no danger? There's no explanation for this. No reason why the shields are impervious, they just never talk about it and hope the audience doesn't think about it either. B. What happened to all the fighters on the Star Destroyers? We just saw all the damage that Kylo Ren and two TIE fighters did to the Resistance capital ship, destroying the hangar bay and blasting Leia into space. So why doesn't the First Order just send everything they have at it? Even if Kylo Ren didn't want to be a part of it, the TIE fighters would easily catch up with the ship and blow the shit out of it. Sure, they would have lost a few fighters, but the hangar bay is destroyed, there aren't any fighters to repel the attack, and with all the Star Destroyers following them, there clearly would be about a thousand TIE fighters just waiting to go and blow up the last of the resistance hierarchy. I remember people mumbling this into the theater on opening night, so clearly this was an extremely obvious option that once again Reen Johnson just hopes the audience doesn't think about. C. Why don't they just light speed jump in the transports? Now this might be a stretch, but consider this. We know that X-Wings and other basic fighter craft have light speed capabilities. It seems every form of space vehicle has light speed. Otherwise, how the hell would you get around anywhere in this galaxy? So why don't they do that right off the bat? Fuel up the transports and then jump to light speed, each ship going in different directions with a final position for everyone to eventually meet up at. They never specifically say that these transports don't have light speed capability. However, who would build a ship a transport no less without the ability for light speed. That just seems like an incredibly stupid design choice. Now you could argue that splitting up the resistance would have been a bad idea for sparking the fire of hope or some other bullshit, but what is a better idea? Listening to a lockjaw, purple hair toting moron who is giving no orders whatsoever and eventually will ride into certain death or actually fucking doing something about it. It's not like the First Order could track all of them. They even said that the ships have cloaking technology. Use it to get some space, then jump in all different directions. This is such a bloody side idea that this isn't even one of my main criticisms of stupidity for the scenario, but thinking about it, it's a pretty sound idea. D, and the most obvious one, why don't the Star Destroyers just light speed jump ahead of them? Probably the most obvious is why didn't the First Order just light speed jump ahead of them? This one stood out like a sore fucking thumb to me. Of course they couldn't jump right in front of the Resistance ship, so why don't they just have one or a few break off and jump away with the intention of jumping back ahead of the Resistance ship and cornering them? Could have made for an interesting scenario, watching all these ships break off for a mysterious reason only to have them reappear in front of them. Now there really isn't a way the Resistance could have gotten out of that, but if I could literally have thought of that within the first 30 seconds of this chase starting, I know I'm not the only one who thought this. The absolute blatant simplicity of this idea kind of angers me that Rian Johnson let this slide. I would have rather had them do a rerun of the Battlestar Galactica episode number 33, where the human beings are being followed by the Cylons who have to keep jumping to a new location every 33 minutes because the Cylons are following them. That storyline makes way more sense than this garbage. The whole time you kept on thinking there was this traitor angle that was going to eventually come up so it would have made 
made way more sense than this MacGuffin tracking device. It would have made the Vice Admiral Holdo's extremely ridiculous lack of command procedures make more sense, and this entire scenario wouldn't have been able to be broken by basic logic. It's a little insulting as a moviegoer, let alone a Star Wars fan, when something so simple is so bloody obvious, yet the movie continues on its self-absorbed blissfulness as to not actually look at the giant sarlacc pit of a plot hole staring everyone in the face. Number 5, Vice Admiral Holdo. Where to begin with this woman? Now, I like Laura Dern as an actress. For most of you, you'll probably recognize her as Ellie Sattler from Jurassic Park. You might also recognize her as the same character in the third film where she got shafted. As an actress, I don't mind her. and From what I've read, she seems like a pretty alright person and she had a cute moment with BB-8 during filming of the movie. But whoa, is her Holdo character awful. Literally a terrible character. Every aspect of her character is hypocritical, ignorant, and downright daft. In The Last Jedi, after Leia comes back from her Superman spacewalk and is recovering in the med bay, Vice Admiral Holdo is introduced as the new Tempo Commander of the Resistance. She then gives a speech about holding on to hope, telling everyone to stay at their stations, and may the Force be with them. Which, by the way, they copy and pasted that a few more times into her script. But she doesn't give them any real plans, or in fact any orders other than to sit tight and go straight ahead. Poe, understandably, asks her what's the plan. She immediately degrades him, calling him a hot shot, and announces that she doesn't like him and his actions, and doesn't give him squat. Remember this for later, by the way. Now yes, Poe had been demoted, but he still had a reasonable question. What was the plan? But she doesn't tell him it. In fact, she doesn't seem to tell anyone other than possibly the lady who announced her in, and that's only from assumption. She, for absolutely no reason other than create an unnecessary thread of tension and drama, gives bup kiss about what the plan to do is. Her character is a fucking idiot. Now some people have defended her actions saying that soldiers should follow their commander's orders and that her actions are part of Poe's lesson. As said before, I am not against Poe learning a lesson and getting a character arc. I am, however, against it being carried out in an absolutely moronic fashion. Why doesn't she tell anyone anything about an extremely simple plan? We're going to an old rebel base planet where we will sneak off the transports undetected while the main ship and the First Order pass by. Boom! That was one sentence. So how is that so hard to say? She tells them to hold on to hope? How can they when you don't give them jack shit, lady? That's not holding on to hope. That's not even blind hope. That's outright fanatical loyalty thinking there. For example, do you think Eisenhower just told the Allied forces prior to D-Day to hold on to hope and get on those boats and head towards France? No! There was so much micro-planning in every detail. The forces knew the plans because that's what a leader does. You tell them what the plan is. Sure, Poe was demoted, but clearly he isn't the only one who was concerned about the lack of orders. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had a fellow group of mutineers at the end. They weren't demoted, so why didn't she tell them? Even when he finds out that she's fueling the transports, with what fuel, by the way, I thought they were running on fumes, she still refuses to tell them anything, even though the situation is clearly dire, and the Resistance are in need of something more to hold on to other than how cool your hair may look, lady. In an interview with the AV Club, Dern described her character as, and I quote, willing to look at the bigger picture and sacrifice for the good of the whole. End quote. So looking at the bigger picture is not telling your troops jack shit about his two-step plan? It's because of her actions that Poe, Finn, and Rose go behind her back and try to get something done. Now, I know that the portrayal of Benikiel I don't do shit for this movie Del Toro is supposed to show that sometimes listening to your higher-ups is the way to go, but instead this just comes off as bullshit corporate bootlicking logic. If she had simply told them the plan in the first place, the mission for the hacker would have never happened. The whole crisis would have been averted. So in the end, all the losses the Resistance suffers, the betrayal of the hands of the hacker, the apparent failure of the resistance, are all because this dumb purple hair toting prat refused to open her goddamn mouth and say it was an extremely simple and effective plan. And going back to my point about Poe and his supposed lesson, how is he supposed to learn anything when the person supposedly teaching him about the errors of his ways is doing so by enacting errors that are far worse than his? This isn't a two wrongs makes a right situation, this is straight out bullshit writing. And remember how I told you to remember her initial remarks about Poe? Well, when Leia conveniently wakes up and stuns Poe, Holdo comments about his roguish actions but then says she likes him. What the absolute fuck, lady? You are a goddamn hypocrite. Everything you have stated or done throughout the entire movie has been a big fat fuck you to the audience and their intelligence. And to add even more salt on the wound, she's the one who gets to go out on an incredible high note with the light speed jump sacrifice. This is, of course, after half the resistance is blown to kingdom come. What were you doing, lady, writing a galactic blog about how you really showed men how terrible of a commander you are? That shit should have been for Akbar, and everybody knows it. You 
you robbed us of a fitting end to the one of the most enduring memeable characters in Star Wars history, Reen Johnson. Instead of giving a glorious and fitting end to our oblivious fish-faced friend, you give it to this confused, hypocritical, purple hair moron and toss Akbar out the airlock unceremoniously. Now, from what I've gathered from reviewers both for and against this movie, is that she is supposed to continue to represent the power of women in the new updated Star Wars film series. Now, I can understand and appreciate that. I will be first to admit that women have had a pretty crappy track record of being the damsels in distress or other quite degrading characters, and that shit still hasn't gone away. Look at movies like Jupiter Ascending, for example. However, Star Wars seems to have taken it to the extreme and just said that women are the best because they are women. Look at Rey, for example. She is a stereotype definition Mary Sue if you ever wanted to see one. However, this time, the ridiculous female character type goes to Holdo because despite all of this, all this bullshit she causes, all the unnecessary drama the seemingly SJW resistance leader causes, all the moronic and completely idiotic decisions she makes or doesn't make in truth, she is still portrayed as the right one and a strong female character who men like Poe should just listen to. Now, I will try and say this as politely as I can. Go fuck yourself, movie. The whole point of character development in films is that they are defined by their flaws more so than their strengths, and throughout the movie, their journey is to overcome those flaws. Not many movies get this right, as it is easier said than done, but when it is done correctly, you have a good character on your hands. Holdo doesn't do any of this shit. If anything, she goes against the idea completely. I know that she is only a side character, but after all the bullshit she puts us through, her and Leia come across at the end like, we showed you men what's what. Now again, I'm not against the idea of female empowerment, female characters, etc. I love characters like Ellen Ripley or Sarah Connor, who did exactly what it seems no current filmmaker can do. Make a strong female character who proves herself not only to the obnoxious world of men, but also to herself and the audience. Sure, Wonder Woman was great, but when I think of great female characters, I will always think of Ellen Ripley. Get away from her, you bitch! <laughs> So there you go, those are my five main reasons why I thought The Last Jedi was the worst. It just seems like Rian Johnson made notes throughout the entire script saying, logic doesn't exist in my movie. I hate to rag on the guy as he is one of my favorite filmmakers. I loved Looper and Brick and thought Brothers Bloom was an enjoyable time. And I like that Disney took a chance on a guy who wasn't in the norm of making blockbuster films and gave him a shot at the director's chair. But when a story so littered with plot holes makes it to the final stage and no one in the room had a single brain cell to point out the glaring absence of logic throughout this movie, I cannot forgive that. But now that this video has ended, the table will be flipped. While I found some parts of The Last Jedi incredibly stupid, there are some parts I found pretty good and even downright amazing. So stay tuned for that video to come. And I know I didn't get all the points that people have pointed out about this movie, so here's a list of all the other brain dead parts I could think of, and here's some cheesy music to go along with it.